Welcome to the Nature of Teaching Professional Development webinar series. My name is Lauren Timi, and I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Educator for Purdue Extension in Delaware County. Today's webinar is entitled Hellbenders Rock. We will be covering Eastern Hellbender biology and how it relates to water quality. We will also work through some ways to help conserve them. Joining me today is Nick Bergmeier, a research biologist and, Expen and extension wildlife specialist in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources with Purdue University. Nick will be presenting on the background information for this unit, and then we will have a video from Becca Cates on the core value or the core of the lesson. I will then finish the webinar highlighting additional resources and the procedure to obtain your certification of completion. Nick, I will turn things over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. So this lesson, uh, it focuses on kindergarten through fifth grade. Uh, it, it should take between 45 and 60 minutes to complete. And it just has several uh, just really simple objectives. We, we want students to be able to identify hellbenders and to be able to describe their, their life stages, so their life cycle. Uh, we also want students to be able to explain their relationship between water and, and finally be able to list some ways to help conserve hellbenders. And, and I'm just going to run through some real basic background information on, on hellbenders and amphibians and, and then turn it over to uh, Becca for a video. So hellbenders are considered indicator species of, of a healthy stream ecosystem. And, and all an indicator species is, is a species that tells you something about the environment in which it lives. Uh, and in this case, if, if you have healthy hellbender populations, that tells you that you, you probably have a healthy stream. So an ecosystem is just very simply the the network of all the living and non-living things in a given area. So examples that most of us are, are familiar with would be the forest uh, with you know, deer and, and insects and fungi as the living things. And then also you know, the soil and rocks and, and water that as, as the long non-living pieces. Uh, we also have you know, freshwater ecosystems, which is what we're focused on with hellbenders, deserts, a, a whole number of different types of, of ecosystems. So hellbenders are amphibian, uh, and amphibians are uh, just basically they're, they're vertebrates that are ectothermic or cold-blooded. So they they do not regulate their own body temperature. They are essential. Their body temperature is is basically whatever the surrounding temperature is. They have shell shellless eggs. So we're mostly familiar with birds' eggs, which have that that hard shell, or reptile eggs, which have a leathery shell. Uh, amphibians have just it's just like a, a gooey blob. They, amphibian actually means double life. And, and this is just a reference to the fact that, that most amphibians uh, spend at least some portion of their life in water, whether that's their eggs or their larvae or even, a, or even adults. Now, this does not actually apply to hellbenders because hellbenders are fully aquatic. They never come out of the water. Uh, amphibians have smooth permeable skin. So permeable is when, when things can actually move through the skin, so it's, it's absorptive. And there are three groups of amphibians. There's the frogs that all of us are familiar with. There are salamanders, which, which most people are familiar with. And then there's Sicilians, which is a, a rare uh, tropical group of amphibians. They actually kind of look like giant worms that, that most people never see. Now, many amphibians, like I mentioned, they, they are aquatic or, or at least semi-aquatic. And, and hellbenders are actually uh, fully aquatic. So what is the hellbender? Uh, the hellbender, it's North America's largest salamander. They can live uh, up to 30 years uh, in the wild and even longer in captivity. They can get up to five pounds and, and up to 29 inches long. So they're, they're a very large uh, salamander. And they have several characteristics that, that uh, help really define what a hellbender is. So the first is that they are they are brown with uh, brown or green with black spots. And this, this helps them uh, camouflage. So that hellbender in that picture is, is very difficult to see. If you were actually in the wild, it would be probably harder to see than it is in this picture. Uh, they have these large skin folds that run along the sides of their bodies that uh, they, are, they are there to help increase the surface area to absorb oxygen. So hellbenders, they, they don't have gills once they, uh, they don't have gills once they reach the juvenile stage. 
And so since they never come out of water, they need a good way to, to absorb oxygen through that permeable skin. And having these extra skin folds just, just helps them do that. Uh, they have a good sense of smell. They have nostrils. This is how they, they find prey in the, in the water. They also have a very large mouth. You can see in this photo, uh, the, the mouth is as wide as the head. So they, they actually can open that mouth and they just they vacuum feed. So they just kind of suck things down into their, into their throat. And they don't, as I mentioned, they don't have gills as adults or juveniles. They, they lose those at about two years old. And then finally, they have that big paddle-shaped tail that's, that's flattened from side to side. And that just helps them to, uh, to move from place to place if they need to, uh, to swim away from a predator really quickly. They don't swim really well. Uh, they don't swim like fish. But that big tail can pro propel them uh, away from something. And then finally, they are, they are covered in slime. And they can produce this slime to if they become agitated or if something tries to eat them. And, and it is distasteful. So hellbenders require sort of a specific type of habitat. And, and all habitat is, is it's basically the food, the water, the shelter, and the space uh, that a, a species needs to rear its young. Now, hellbenders require cool, clean rivers and streams. So that, that is that connection to, to uh, water quality. Uh, they, they prefer a gravel cobble substrate. And, and that would be where their, their larvae spend most of their time. And they also need large boulders, uh, which is where the, the juveniles and the adults will, will spend most of their time. And that's also where the, the adults breed. And then finally, they need crayfish uh, for food. That's their primary food source. But they will also eat uh, other fish and, and some macro invertebrates, some small bugs that are, that are down on the bottom of the river. Now, the, the adults, they breed under those big rocks. And hellbenders start out as eggs. Uh, and they, they hatch in about 30 to 60 days, uh, at which point they're larvae. And they are, they are gilled larvae. So the larvae do have gills right behind their heads. And they, they'll, at about two years of age, they'll lose those gills. And at that point, they'll be considered a juvenile. Uh, so you know, basically like a teenager. And they're, they'll be a juvenile for about another four or five years, at which point they will be considered mature, usually six to eight years old, and, and they'll be considered an adult and, and live another 20 to 25 years. Now, hellbenders, since they are fully aquatic they, and they have that permeable skin, they really need uh, good water quality. And, and, and good water quality is important for all wildlife and for people. And that permeable skin, as mentioned earlier, it, it facilitates the movement of water and other substance through the skin. So there are several things that can really threaten something that spends its whole life in water and, and has absorptive skin. So one of the major threats to hellbenders is sedimentation. And, and sedimentation is basically just when, when soil gets washed off the, the, the land and into the river, uh, that soil settles on the bottom of the river and it can either turn the bottom of the river if it's enough it can turn into a mud bottom rather than a rocky bottom or if it's if it's not a ton it can it just settles in the spaces between the rocks and that can really reduce the habitat available especially to those those larval hellbenders so they like to burrow down on those rocks and when there's too much sedimentation they basically don't have anywhere to live and, and the species starts to decline uh, runoff uh, from these, these fields and, and other areas can also uh, just generally increase flooding with climate change as we get more uh, rain or at least more intense rain events. Uh, we do see increased flooding. And it can also, if there are nutrients on the field, so, so fertilizers for crops, when that gets into the water, those, those fertilizers are essentially just food for, for plants. And that food, those increased nutrients, cause algae growth in the, in the river and when algae grows in the river, when it dies, it decomposes and it sucks oxygen out of the river, which is bad for, for most wildlife, but especially for hellbenders, which, which have to absorb that oxygen through their skin. So there are several conservation activities uh, that we, we promote for, for landowners that, that people can use uh, to help you know, protect against these things. One of, one of the main things we, we promote is to not move rocks. Uh, it, it seems kind of simple, but in a lot of areas, especially in and highly used uh, parks. Uh, people like to take rocks out of the stream and, and put them on the river and, and make little, little stacks out of them. And that could be especially bad for hellbenders because you can either directly kill the hellbender if you accidentally smash them under the rock, or you're just moving their habitat out of the river. And, 
And in some areas, people move so many rocks, the hellbenders have disappeared because there's not enough habitat for them. Uh, sort of along the same line, we, we encourage people to uh, carry your boats through shallow water. And we don't actually mean pick your boat up and carry it. What we really mean is, is pull your boats, so get out of the boat and walk through the riffle. Uh, if a boat has you know, a, an extra 100 or 200 pounds in it, as you move along those rocks the hellbenders hide under, you can really crush the hellbenders. Uh, and you can also crush freshwater mussels. So getting out and, and walking them through those shallow areas prevents that. Uh, we encourage people to properly dispose of, of toxic chemicals and pharmaceuticals. So don't put them down your drain. Uh, a lot of wastewater treatment plants can't actually uh, filter this stuff out and they don't treat them well. So it ends up just moving right through the, the treatment plant and into the water system. And you can contact your local pharmacy or your local uh, uh, waste uh, disposal company or town or county waste disposal and, and they could tell you you know the best places to get rid of these things uh, we encourage people to pick up their pet waste and to not put like lawn waste into uh, into storm drains uh, storm drains frequently uh, drain directly into water bodies and so basically adding the pet waste and the and the, the leaves and the grass clippings that just adds to that nutrient uh, load that goes into the river and, and potentially feeds the algae. Uh, we ask people to pick up trash and don't litter. Uh, a lot of wildlife will swallow trash and litter. Uh, hellbenders can, can swallow hooks or they can swallow bottle caps if they try to eat something. And then finally, we encourage people to install rain barrels or, or rain gardens. And rain barrels, uh, you install them on your gutter and it, they fill with water. And this, this is just a way to help uh, slow the water that moves across the landscape. And it also lets you reduce your water usage. If you have a garden, you can use that rain barrel water to, to water your flowers. And the rain gardens, you, you typically plant these flowers in, in areas that drain directly into like a sinkhole or drain into a storm drain. And this helps to actually filter out some of the runoff from your yard. So if you use fertilizers or pesticides on your yard, they can run into these rain gardens and, and they will they will get partially stuck there and won't run directly into the storm drain. So this is really all the information that, that I wanted to cover for, uh, for this lesson. So now we'll, uh, I'm going to move into uh, Becca's more extensive coverage of the actual lesson plan. And then once that's finished, we'll, we'll go back to Lauren for her to wrap up. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Cates and I'm the Urban Agriculture Extension Educator with Purdue Extension in Lake County, Indiana. Today I'm going to be going over the lesson plan Hellbenders Rock on the Nature of Teaching website. So we're going to go through that lesson and what it would be like to teach with your students. So this is a good lesson for people who have K through five students that they're working with and want to teach them about the endangered Eastern Hellbender and how they relate to water quality. The objectives for this lesson plan are that students would be able to identify the Eastern Hellbender, describe the life stages of the Eastern Hellbender, explain the Eastern Hellbender's relationship to clean water, and list ways to conserve the Eastern Hellbender. So first off, I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to go to the Nature of Teaching website so this is what it would look like if you typed in www.purdue.edu slash nature. Um, it does change to this ag.purdue.edu URL, but um, that's an easy way to find it is that purdue.edu slash nature. And you'll get to this home screen, which tells you a little bit about the nature of teaching. You can click on this formal curriculum tab, go to wildlife. and scroll down until you find Hellbender's Rock, Natural History and Conservation of the Eastern Hellbender. You can get to the lesson plan by clicking download. And then once you click free download, because this is a free downloadable lesson plan, you'll see the whole lesson with all required materials, lesson activities, printables are all here. And so here's where we find how long the lesson plan should take about 60 minutes, the vocabulary and the objectives that students will learn. 
through the lesson plan and also the um, targeted level national standards and Indiana standards. We also have the required materials needed. Um, so you'll actually have to download a few things for free that are linked here. So we have a PowerPoint, a couple of videos, a coloring page for each student. And then also as an optional addition, you can uh, print these pre-post tests for students to take to gauge how much they learn through the lesson plan, um, maybe to be able to give them a grade for the for the lesson. And then we also have, if you're working with K through first graders, to download a Hellbenders Rock adventure worksheet, which looks like a maze for those students. And if you're working with second through fifth grade students, we have a Hellbenders Rock data sheet. So a little bit more advanced for those students. Um, additionally, for this lesson plan, uh, each group of four through six students, so a small group, will need a tablet or a smartphone, some device that's capable of having the Purdue Hellbender Havoc app installed on it. And so this is a free app that you can find on Google Play or the Apple iStore that complements this lesson really well and helps students go through the life of a Hellbender um, and some of its behavior traits and help the Hellbender grow. So once you download those resources, you'll see that we have teacher notes. So we don't expect anybody to be a pro at talking about Eastern hellbenders or water quality or indicator species. So this is just some information to help you be the expert. And then we get to our procedure <clears throat> and our procedure um, shows that after you download those resources, um, and you can optionally have students conduct that pretest. So give them some time to do that. You then introduced a few key, a few key terms. So you can ask students what is an indicator species, and then introduce the concept of an indicator species, which tells us how healthy an ecosystem is. And an ecosystem is that system of living and non-living things working together. And so then you would ask students to provide some examples of ecosystems. So it could be forests, oceans, deserts, any ecosystem that they like, and then introducing the Eastern hellbender as an example of an indicator species for healthy freshwater ecosystems. And you can provide more information on the Eastern hellbender by going back to those teacher's notes again. Then we will show students slide two of that PowerPoint and the video, the adult Hellbender video, which are all downloadable. So let's see. This is what the PowerPoint looks like. And so this is slide two where you can talk about the Eastern Hellbender, have this up on the screen while you're talking about the Eastern Hellbender as an indicator species for freshwater ecosystems. And then you can pull up this adult Hellbender video. And have students watch that video. Then you can ask students, what is a habitat? Um, and explain <laughs> that students, that all animals need three things in their habitat, food, water, and shelter. And ask students what they think the Eastern Hellbender uses for food and shelter. And then explain that Hellbenders eat crayfish and live under large flat rocks. And so that's um, in the PowerPoint, so you can use those as visuals. So crayfish, what hellbenders eat. Lovely picture of a freshwater crayfish. And they live under flat rocks. So you can maybe have a game and ask students to pick out where the hellbender's eye is and where its nose is um, because they're very good at camouflaging. And then we're going to go into explaining the life cycle of an Eastern hellbender um, because they are amphibians and they have the two life stages. Um, although unlike other amphibians, they stay in an aquatic environment. They stay in the water for their whole life from egg to adult. 
Um, and so you can have students explore what does it mean to be an amphibian? What are some other examples of amphibians? Um, and what does their life cycle normally look like? Maybe some of, the students, some of the students have seen tadpoles or maybe some of them have some pet amphibians. Um, and then we can show students the picture of hellbender eggs in the PowerPoint and introduce the term larva and juvenile, which are um, the really young hellbenders with the gills that they're still, they're still using to breathe. And then the juveniles, which are kind of like teenage hellbenders that aren't quite fully mature, but they have absorbed their gills um, and they're breathing more through their skin. And then you can also show them the video for juvenile hellbenders and show slide nine of the PowerPoint. So again, going back to the PowerPoint, we can see examples of hellbender eggs from the Blue River in Indiana, which is the only river in Indiana where the Eastern hellbender lives. And we can see a larval Eastern hellbender at the Purdue Aquatic Research Lab and see that they still have gills. And we can see um, larval eastern hellbenders eating worms again. So these are still the larva. And then we can see those juvenile and we have the accompanying video as well. And these juveniles are also at the Purdue Aquatic Research Lab. So some fun ways for students to be introduced to the life cycle of the Eastern Hellbender. And then we can reinforce and review the Hellbender life cycle by having students complete a coloring page. And so you can download that coloring page using the link in the required materials. And while students are going through that coloring page, you can walk around as the teacher, or if you're on Zoom, you can um, just ask questions to the class um, and ask students to describe the Hellbender based on the coloring sheet and that PowerPoint slide. So the PowerPoint slides. So ask them questions like, how many toes does an Eastern Hellbender have on its front feet versus its back feet, which is pretty interesting. Um, is its head flat or round like a snake? Um, or is it snake shaped? Um, is it sort of triangular? Is the skin smooth or wrinkly? So just different descriptive words that they can use and how students would maybe describe the Eastern Hellbender. So when you click on the coloring, the link to the coloring page, you will come to this activity page for helpthehellbender.org. So if you go to helpthehellbender.org and go to the kids section, you're going to find several activity sheets like word searches and crossword, um, but also coloring pages. And so the coloring page that we want for this activity is this. So students can go through the life cycle of an Eastern Hellbender. You see um, that they have four toes on their front feet, five toes on their back feet. You see how long each life stage lasts. You see that the larvae have gills, but the juvenile don't. So all those different ways of describing the Eastern Hellbender life cycle. So then you can kind of quiz students if you'd like to review, have them uh, flip over their coloring pages and ask them to direct you as you draw an Eastern Hellbender step by step. So this is based on their memory. Um, so they don't have the PowerPoint to look at. They don't have their coloring page to look at. This is just based on their memory of what a Hellbender looks like. Um, have them raise their hands and provide examples of different identifying features like the body shape, the head shape, the number of toes on each foot, all of these things that help the Hellbender adapt to its aquatic environment. And you can also have students complete their own drawing on the back of their own coloring sheet. 
Um, then you can ask students, why is it important to identify the Eastern Hellbender? Why do we need to be able to identify it and explain that Eastern Hellbenders are endangered? Then you can revisit the idea that they're an indicator species that tells us the health of an ecosystem, of their aquatic freshwater ecosystem, and ask them what makes the Hellbenders endangered. Then we can introduce different water quality terms like sediment and, and go back to the PowerPoint for examples and how certain kinds of sediment are important to hellbenders. So sediment is the different kinds of soil and rock. And you can talk about how larval hellbenders need a small gravel to be able to hide in. Um, and those adult hellbenders need the rocks to live in as their, as their homes. But the very fine sediment that comes up as dust can actually inhibit them from uh, being able to smell their food, see in the water, and breathe properly. So going back to that PowerPoint. You can talk about sediment. So we see some different kinds of sediment here. We have larger rocks uh, that don't seem quite large enough for an adult hellbender, but the smaller rocks look like they would be. Um, and it's definitely, it looks like a good place for crayfish to hide out. So that's where their food would be. Then you can ask students how they can help the hellbender. We'll also see here in the PowerPoint examples of an algae, an al algae bloom, an example of an algae bloom, and then also examples of ways you can help water quality, which are not to pour toxins down the drain, leave grass clippings or leaves where they are, or put them in yard waste bags instead of blowing them into the street. Um, rain barrels and rain gardens are good for water quality, picking up pet waste. Um, and then also keeping in mind that storm drains lead to rivers, so not to dump medicine or leaves or any trash down the drain. Um, and then also if you catch a hellbender while fishing, if any of the students fish, cut the line, don't remove the hook, um, because that is the, what's best for their mouth, and you'll see that in the, in the video game. And if you see an eastern hellbender, report your sighting to the help, the hellbender.org or a local park ranger. Then you can introduce students to the Hellbender Havoc app. So splitting them into groups and have, having them um, introduced to the app, they learn how to play it. We have directions for the activities here um, based on which grade level you have, K through first or second through fifth and what activity sheet they're using. So we'll skip down here for the activity portion. So we're dividing students into groups give everyone who's a K through first grader an adventure worksheet, which looks like the maze and is at the end of this lesson plan. Um, and each of these teams will be playing the video game. So the Help Under Havoc app. And then while they're waiting for their turn to play the video game, they'll complete the adventure worksheet. So they'll go through the maze. And in the worksheet, students pretend that they're the hellbender following the path that takes them to the end of the river to find their eggs. So they're a den master adult male hellbender that actually is the one that protects the eggs, not the female. Um, and so they must avoid paths that lead to things that reduce water quality, like blowing leaves into the street and choose paths that lead to things that improve water quality, like using rain barrels and trees that reduce erosion and also reduce fine sediment from um, dispersing into the water. Um, and they also must avoid algal blooms that are usually a sign of poor water quality. And they must follow the crayfish, which is their main source of food. They can also continue to work on their coloring pages. If your students are in grades two through five, they would each have a Hellbender's rock data sheet, which has a, a graph for them to be filling out and questions for them to be writing answers to. Um, so each team will be playing the, the Hellbender Havoc app as a team. They will take turns playing the game. Um, and before playing the video game, they'll work on their and their teams to answer the questions. Um, and so those, initial questions that they'll answer. We'll ask them, will your team score more or fewer points with each game played? So if student one goes and then student two goes, will they will student two earn more or fewer points? 
And then why do you think that will happen? So they'll enter those answers, write those answers on the data sheet before they even play the game for the first time. Um, and then at the end of each turn, every student must record every team member's points earned with each gameplay using the graph on the data sheet. So they're going to be recording their points earned on the data sheet. So using the bar graph and they'll be able to track um, over time, the different number of points. Um, and then you as the teacher can explain the directions for the Hellbender Havoc uh, app activity. Um, we also have in our sneak peek video, a good uh, demonstration for that. So you can refer back to that as well. Once every student has gotten a chance to play the game, they can work as a team to write answers to questions four through five on the data sheet, which asks them, did your team score more or fewer points with each game played? And why do you think that happened? So having them use the scientific process to first create a prediction and then conduct their experiment and then draw conclusions. And once your students are done with the activity, you can review with them by asking questions like, what do hellbenders eat? What do you do if you catch a hellbender on your fishing line? All of these questions are written here in the lesson plan. And then again, as an optional uh, bonus, you can have students complete that pre-post test. So that's the Hellbenders Rock lesson on the nature of teaching. We hope you enjoy this lesson with your students and you all learn a lot about the Eastern Hellbender and ways to conserve it and enjoy learning about nature and our natural resources. Thanks and have a great day. All right. Well, I want to thank you for joining us for the Nature of Teaching Professional Development webinar entitled Hellbenders Rock. I hope you consider participating in our many other webinars through the Nature of Teaching. If you enjoy this webinar, I encourage you to click on the card in the top right of your screen and visit the Nature of Teaching YouTube channel. Here you can view sneak peeks of lesson plans that are directly related to the webinar you just completed. To obtain your certificate of completion for this 30 minute webinar, please click on the second card in the top right of your screen. Here you'll be directed to a short Qualtrics survey to provide us some feedback on the program. Once that is completed, you'll be automatically emailed your certificate of completion. We hope you enjoyed learning with us and consider participating in additional professional development webinars offered by the Nature of Teaching team. For answers to your questions, feel free to email Nick, myself, or Dr. Rod Williams at the email addresses provided on this, this screen. Um, and until then, thank you for engaging our youth with nature.